Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for making it to the session, although I know it's uh, quite tempting after lunch to go and snooze somewhere in the corner. Um, I hope you will enjoy the next 45 minutes with us. I would like to thank the organizers, besides all other things, for giving me two Philip Jones in one panel. <laughs> so we're going to have to manage that somehow. I don't, I'm probably going to call them the tall Philip Jones. <laughs> Double oh, L, one you. L. And a very tall <laughs> Philip Jones. <laughs> the Jonas. I thought anyway, there be a no. fight then. Yeah, I feel discriminated against. <laughs> we will figure it out. Okay, so our topic is um, hospitality innovation, view from the boardroom. Uh, we have uh, gentlemen who are um, heads and um, or very top managers of uh, several very prominent organizations in the industry. So I'm quite certain that we will have a um, very useful, enjoyable, um, and maybe sometimes entertaining conversation. So just to set the stage, um, back in the early days of the hospitality industry development, um, early days of Hilton's and Marriott's, think about 50, 60 years ago, the average hotel room uh, was a lot more modern and exciting than an average home. Um, first TVs, first um, cable, first telephones, all appeared, appeared in the luxury hotels worldwide. However, as uh, the time went on, uh, the industry seems to have lost its edge. And um, nowadays the technology of residential developments is uh, sometimes, sometimes, not always, by miles ahead. So what happened? Some uh, might argue that this is connected to uh, um, the times when Back in the old days, management, branding, and ownership was um, starting to split up when Hilton's and Marriott starting to sell off their assets. So they lost the kind of long-term uh, view on the projects and on owning the properties. Um, some may say that this is the reason, the reason for this is that the hotel is no longer kind of the fortress uh, in the unknown desert that it used to be when it was the only safe, comfortable, and sort of guaranteed place around, but simply just a mere matter of convenience. So the current stage of hospitality uh, market development in the GCC region uh, simply screams innovation. Here in the region, we have matured very fast um, because we were playing catch up with the rest of the world because we needed to prove ourselves and prove ourselves fast. And uh, now we're starting to get into the forefront of the industry with uh, many revolutionary and um, award-winning developments and initiatives here. So non-standard view is proliferating the hotel space here and this approach is characteristic of everyone in the industry. Um, all players, uh, be it governments, government agencies, uh, be it hotel investors and owners, uh, funds, brands, management companies, everyone. So let's try to find out what this means in the day-to-day -day terms. So, um, gentlemen, I think uh, to set the stage, let's have a discussion about what really drives innovation in our industry. Um, the tastes of the traveling public has, have been changing, right? Um, having a comfortable bed, safe and uh, clean interior, hot shower, tasty breakfast, no longer enough uh, for most travelers. No longer also a guaranteed success factor of a hotel. So in fact, now tra uh, travelers, c consumers, our clients, are getting more and more demanding every day. They want some strange things, they want atmosphere, they want an experience, they want a wow factor, immersion into local culture, etc. So are, is our industry driven by what our consumers want, or do we from our side also play a part in that role? Or maybe the source of innovation in the hotel and tourism industry is the governmental policies, or is it maybe the fashion, simply the fashion and the trends? Or could it be ROI of the projects, as simple as that? So I will stop talking now and give the stage over to you. I promise I will not talk that long anymore. Um, in any order that you prefer, please. Sure. <clears throat> Look, Happy, I think I'd like to go back to your first statement about, um, you know, going back 30, 40, 50 years ago and hotels probably being more to cutting edge than they are today. I think the thing that's changed is the speed of change, right, and the speed of growth. You know, we see it if we look at even the way the world's population has grown. You know, 20 years ago, what, we were at 5 billion. Now we're at 9 billion. You know, we've nearly doubled the world's population. Change, innovation is just happening at a speed that it's extremely hard to keep up with. And it's not just 
our industry, it's, it's all industries. Look at automotive, look at tech. A good example of this is iPhones. How many times do you buy an iPhone and within a year you don't have the current iPhone anymore? It is hard for everyone to keep up. So I think that's the kind of first thing we need to consider. <clears throat> Any yeah, no, thoughts? no, uh, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> I don't know if you. Did, uh, Sorry, Colin, we're expecting you to stop quite so yeah. abruptly, you know. Yeah. But um, no, I think that's absolutely right. I, but the, the big drive, I mean, obviously, necessity is the mother of invention, and I think you know one of the things that has driven many of the changes we've seen in the hotel industry over the sort of last sort of ten years. I mean, COVID was a fantastic innovator when it came to technology. Everybody suddenly didn't want this, you know, hotel industry had all been about personal contact and as much face-to-face -face time as you could possibly get with your guests. And then suddenly we were told, no one wants to talk to you anymore. You want to be as far away from each other as you possibly can. And as a result of that, technologies were introduced which have, which have helped, you know, uh, exasperate, not exasperate, but have helped create that. So, you know, in terms of online check-in, pre-arrival check-ins, check-ins with iPhones, Keep using, you know, not having to be given a key card anymore, being able to use your phone to open doors. All these things have come about as a result of such, uh, the reduced contact that a lot of guests required over that very short period of time. And I think, you know, also from a bottom line point of view, these things start to make sense. You know, when you can cut down the number of employees you have, and as we all know, you know, most hotels, not so much in this region, but worldwide, you know, it is the payroll that drives many of the, uh, the demands and the cost-cutting that we look at. And of course, anything that technology does to help us with that is a good thing. And then the whole advent of GRM, which, you know, you know where you see guest rooms, now the technology in guest rooms is fantastic. What's available to you, you know, if a guest doesn't move for about 30 seconds, everything shuts down. And I think, you know, this, these sort of changes in technology have been driven by, by financial demands, as well as by, as you say, the demand of the guest and the requirement not to be having so much face-to-face -face time with, with the actual operator. And if I, if I may add, uh, innovation is a mindset, actually. Once we have it as a core and the spirit of whatever we're doing from a business perspective or from a customer journey's perspective, automatically it will match. Technology without uh, the business implication, it's just tech sitting there, like a strategy without execution. So whenever the mindset is there from bottom to top, from top to bottom, depending on the leadership, then the full ecosystem is there to make sure that whether the new communities that are upcoming, whether the millennials, the Gen Zs, which represent a quarter of the total uh, global population, then everyone will find the uh, truth to their feet. So I think one of the things that we have to really think about is it's great to hear from our hotel partners about the importance of technology. But what you don't want to do is lose that authenticity, yeah. lose that personal connection, lose that personal contact, because that's what sets you apart as a destination. And certainly in what we're doing in Alula is making sure that all the hotel development we do is done sustainably and done that's in a way that's authentic. So when a visitor comes, they experience a very experiential sort of visit so that it's not the same cookie cutter approach across the industry. And I think that's where destinations like ours sure. can stand out because we really focused on sustainability and authenticity. And Philip mentioned that authenticity, if we keep authenticity at the main core center of all our interaction by caring, um, uh, caring about the guests, caring about the employees, caring about the business owners, the investor, the top line, the bottom line, then automatically it will drive this mindset to be organically driven and to grow the right direction. I think the core of our industry has not changed. Taking care sure, of the customer, so. taking care of the employee, that will always be there. But as David said, technology, and particularly through COVID, we've seen better ways of doing it and or alternative ways of doing it, yeah. you know? No, it's interesting what you're saying. I mean, we've just launched something called the Dubai Lifestyle Experience where, you know, Guests that come and stay with us had the opportunity to, to buy a package which has a, a, a shopping list of different things they can do while in Dubai. And they can pick or choose five of those different either cultural or sightseeing events that they want to do. And, and that has been incredibly successful because, as you say, people still want to have that experience of the, the country they're in. So um, I think, you know, we've become more innovative as we've been forced to. And, um, and you know, technology has helped us do that for sure. So since we started uh, talking about technology, uh, back to that question, um, let's, let's speak about this a little bit. So oh, quite obviously that innovation in hospitality industry and tourism uh, is not purely related to tech. 
right, or IT. It can potentially be design. There is a lot of cutting edge stuff going on, uh, obviously, in Saudi as well as in the UAE and all around the region. Uh, it can be connected to the service concepts, um, you know, what things we do or do not do and provide to our guests in our hotels. But um, speaking about pure technology, um, so it drives, obviously it drives a lot these days. It drives the customer journey. It drives the uh, commercial success of the enterprise sometimes. Um, what do you think are kind of the most promising cutting edge things that you are seeing in uh, your areas of responsibility, which can um, drive change and make, uh, make a lot of impact on the hospitality industry? And are there any specifics in terms of implementing this here in the region? maybe policy-related or legislation-related or mentality? Sorry, happy to, happy to pick it up. Um, look, uh, in a core uh, and the way we... So, first of all, we have an overarching uh, service culture, the heartist culture, which speaks to people delivering service from the heart, but being like an artist, being creative. And, of course, they're our most important resource in terms of how we, we service our guests. But how we manage those harshness is incredibly important. And technology is providing a solution for us to do that, to track their performance, to track their career potential. And you know, particularly when you're managing a portfolio of 5,500 hotels globally and an employee population base of over 300,000 people, providing people with hope and opportunity and making them aware of that opportunity can be sometimes difficult across so many geographies, even across a region uh, like this. So we've, we've implemented a technology system that every colleague is, is enrolled into uh, and it's giving us a much better opportunity to again track performance, manage potential uh, and align the interests of the company finding the best talent and aligning the interests of the individual fulfilling their individual aspirations into future roles. So this talks about um, this talks about human resource management. Right. Absolutely. Uh, is there anything that you're seeing from uh, your standpoint as a brand, as an operator, that is um, may maybe helping drive innovation from the standpoint of the guest? Yep. Uh, so well, th there's a there's a lot of things. Uh, again, understand the customer experience comes from the employee. One of the things that we had to do through through COVID, uh, and COVID was a great wake up call for us, was balancing our, the level of ladies and gentlemen that we have in every department to the right level of activity. So we went through what we call a manning calculator exercise. Uh, and it, was, it, was quite, it took us about four months during lockdown where we locked a bunch of very smart people, much smarter than myself, in a room uh, and came up with a program that allowed us to look based on productivity standards, how many people and in which areas we should have them to meet certain levels of activity. That has allowed us not only to be more effective, but continue to achieve greater levels of our reputation performance score. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much. Please go ahead. Phil. So one of the things we're doing in Alula is we have QR codes all over the destination. And then we've hosted 78 events from our season that started in September and ends on Friday. And what we do is evaluate each event to see what the guest satisfaction level is, what the issues are, and if people are enjoying their experience in Alula. So we get instant feedback that we can address immediately if there's an issue. We send a team, a SWAT team, to sort of figure out what the problem is and address it. And so that's using technology to make sure that the customer journey and the customer experience is, is done properly. And I think that's where technology can really help us across the sector as opposed to just you know using it because you have an app. Everyone has an app, right? And, and everyone wants to match what the other, their competitor has. But what, I think what we have to do is really use technology in a way that sort of integrates the visitor experience and the visitor journey in a way that makes sense for a particular destination. What we do in Alula is very different than what you're doing. But at the same time, it applies across both spectrums, don't you think? True, 100%. To your point, tailor-making the experience, it starts pre-journey. So this is why today the hype around the Web3 space, the metaverse, um, NFTs, I name it, all of these big names, techs, so AI, with ChatGPT, and so. By eliminating some bureaucracy from the hotels, actually, it allowed the human interaction to be smoother. And thus, using the technology in that way, it will not replace the human element, it will only 
increase the uh, authenticity and the genuine relationship. When you are upon a check-in, and we mentioned it, not all hotels have the keyless check-in whatsoever. And we're talking about metaverses, Web3, blockchain, AI, whatsoever. So let's go back to basics. Let's eliminate all this useless bureaucracy because today, and with the mobile, we can check in. We don't need any more to be physically there. But what we need is an interaction with someone in particular that would make us feel welcome to the property or the destination. So let's use the technology, um, again, to bridge the physical, bridging physical with digital with a purpose. As long as there is a purpose, there is a community, and then there is a path to uh, enhance everyone's life, actually. Yeah, I think the big change is speed of delivery, isn't it? 100%. I mean, so now you're getting, as you say, instant feedback. You're able to communicate directly. You can actually put promotions yeah. into a, you know, onto a guest phone while he's in the hotel, get direct feedback with him. And I think that's... that, And you can talk to them at any point of the day, anywhere, rather than waiting until they're back in their room at night. Exactly. And, but, so I think... You know, technology has really helped improve that guest interaction massively and, and speed it up dramatically. And I think, you know, the faster you are, the faster you can rectify or continue to deliver. So I think that's really good. Okay, thank you very much. So in your opinion, technology is more an inhibitor of like, yeah. experience, etc., not the Catalyst. means and ends of itself. I mean, I remember when the uh, W brand came out, they were like really cutting edge technology and you couldn't figure out how your toilet works at the W hotel. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Or how to turn your lights on, I know. I mean, I think I'm bragging and I'm getting old, but sometimes I still can't figure out how to switch off the lights in the hotel room. <laughs> That's when I call, the, call it overdoing. Um, okay, so going back to the inhibitor thing. Um, with, uh, so I have two representatives of what I consider governmental entities. And uh, Philip, I'm sorry, I'm generalizing you as to be a part of the PIF. So we have a fund and we have a tourism agency. So in my opinion, the role of the governmental agency and governmental entity is to become an inhibitor of the private sector investment and innovation in investment. Obviously, you can't impose anything on an investor, right? If people are bringing private money and investing and building a hotel in your realm of responsibility, you know, you say, you say thank you and you take it. So how do you drive? What are some of the things that are helping you drive? How do you, how do you initiate this or how do you help them instigate this? So from the Alula perspective, we have a partnership with the Alula Development Company, which is a PIF-owned entity. And they're responsible for the development of all the new hotels in the destination. And so what we do at the destination level is we align with them on the brand selection and we align with them on the location and we give them the permitting and the regulatory approvals. But at the end of the day, it's the private sector that's driving this through the PIF investments. And so it's, it's truly, to, to make it work, it has to be a public-private partnership, which is what we're doing in Alula. We have opened uh, three hotels. We have 10 more in process as we speak. And what we've done is really recognize that what we're trying to do is not be a mass tourism destination. Um, some of the hotels are 30 rooms, some are 40 rooms, some are 50. The biggest hotel will be 200 rooms because at the end of the day, we want to maybe reach a million visitors by the end of 2030. Because what we're offering in Alula is to be very bespoke, very individualistic, and to be very authentic. And so it would not fit if we had a big high-rise hotel in the middle of the desert. Uh, everything we do is built sustainably into the environment. You know, Lula's been around for thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, 7,000 the last years continuously, with each civilization leaving their mark, with amazing monuments, archaeological sites, artifacts. What we do, we need to do is preserve it and protect it for the next 7,000 years. And so we have to do everything in a very sustainable way that fits into the environment. And that's how finding the right partners who understand the brand, who understand our brand pillars, who are willing to invest and be part of this journey with us is how we're approaching the development of the destination. So essentially, find the right partners and set an example on your own. Is, is how you do it. People who kind of get it and wouldn't do it any right. other way. And you know, all the brands come and we're, we're very selective in those we choose because it has to be a good fit for the destination. And it's different because we're not going to have, we may have 2,000 hotel rooms by the end of 2030. So we're not going to have massive numbers, but the numbers we have are going to be high-end luxury travelers who don't mind spending 10,000 SAR a night at Banyan Tree uh, uh, for a, a wonderful hotel stay. So that's the, the target audience we're going after. Okay, very well, thank you very much. And Mo, how do we do it back at home in Rock? <laughs> yeah. So in Russell Khema, and again, when you said innovation is a mindset and uh, everything comes to creating the ecosystem. When you look at our ruler, Sheikh Saud uh, bin Saqal Qasmi, Supreme uh, Council member, 
and the ruler of Ras Al Khaimah, uh, along with the leadership team that is um, leading Ras Al Khaimah, whether from a private sector or public sector, we make sure that the ecosystem is there. And when we say ecosystem, it's about thinking out of the box. It's about keeping uh, the authenticity, again, of Ras Al Khaimah because of its topography, because of the nature element, because of the legacy that we would like to keep for our uh, children, grandchildren, and the next generations, actually. And then you tailor-made it depending on the sector. If it's investment, then if we take an example of a development fund, development fund as an overarching um, uh, vehicle is great, but then you can dissect it to an experiential setup fund. Uh, then you could have an allocated FMB fund. And that way you cluster the destination in a way that it's not overcrowded by a specific either brand or trend or whatsoever. So when you have the full ecosystem, and especially when you have the leadership and the mindset, things can only go uh, the right way. Wonderful. Philip? No? David? No. Okay. <laughs> so that's fine. Um, so I guess the, the answer, if, if we kind of generalize this, is have the right vision from the, uh, from the standpoint of the leadership, uh, pick the right partners, and uh, I think um, last but not least, set the policies right as to uh, bring, bring that innovation, bring the right mindset into the destination, right? Yeah. So um, this has already sounded, this word has already sounded here a few times, and uh, this is, since we're having the view from the boardroom conversation, this is now a darling of the boardroom, um, a few buzzwords, ESG, corporate social responsibility, sustainability, yeah. eco-friendliness, etc. So um, in your opinion, in your businesses, what is all of this for you? Is it just a policy to follow? Um, is, it, um, is it a real thing? Do you connect it with an ROI game? Uh, or is it, you know, just a way to, you know, to look nice in the eyes of your end consumer? Look, I, I, it, it's an essential way of doing business these days. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. the way we're developing, and I go back to my earlier point about the world's growing population, right? We are actually the problem, the growing population, of course. That population needs to consume more and more resources. And of course, therefore, we need everyone to use a little bit less. We need to be a little bit more mindful. So certainly within Accor, our global CEO and chairman, Sebastian Bazin, has made very public and, and, and mindful promises, where, you know, the first of which was the removal of single-use plastics. Unfortunately, he did that in 2020, going into COVID. So we took a, we took a small break because our hotels were largely closed. But last year, we've uh, actually achieved that goal throughout the region with a couple of small exceptions. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, some governments uh, still don't uh, approve filtered water. Uh, they're still catching up with the technology behind it and the, you know, the safety rules and everything else, uh, the standards of dispense bottles and things like that. But by and large, where governments have permitted it, we've achieved uh, that goal across the region in our hotels. And I think that's great. The next thing, of course, is food waste, okay? And yeah. again, back to your point of, is it ROI or is it the right thing to do? Well, it's both, okay? Uh, at the, uh, we are stewards of an asset on behalf of owners, and we have to deliver the right thing in terms of profitability and return on their investment. And if we can do that in a sustainable way, then we're fulfilling both, uh, both missions. Yeah, look, I don't think there's any, I mean, I think most, I would be amazed to find a company that said that sustainability wasn't important to them now. But you know, certainly you know, our, our ethos has always been about being sustainable. You know, we were, I think, the first hotel in Dubai to be completely plastic-free when we had a trip by Wyndham. Um, and you know, all our hotels are now uh, plastic-free. And I think, you know, it's, it, but that's just one of the many, many things we do. We have something we're living with a green heart that we're uh, responsible for. Um, and and it, you know, it, not only is it something that the guest wants. It, but it, you know, not only is it good for you know the CRS as well, but but it's also it, you know in terms of from an ROI perspective, you know it is also important. I mean, one it drives more business into hotels, but also there is huge savings to be made if you're you know if you're not you know bringing in uh, out water from outside the hotels. You know if you are reducing the amount of cleaning time that you're spending in terms of you know, laundry and everything else, all, all these sort of things, or, or reducing your energy expenditure, everything else. All these things are actually things that help your bottom line. So for a hotel not to embrace the various options that are out there, and there's so many, um, you know, it's criminal really at this day and age. And I think 
you know, also the government, in, certainly in Dubai and the UAE generally, is very, very strong in terms of you know, driving what they can do. I mean, the DTCM has just come out with this, uh, the new footprint for how to measure the carbon uh, impact yes, of uh, carbon, all carbon. the properties, all the hotels, and you know, with a, with a view to everybody being carbon neutral. And I think you know these things are absolutely essential going forward. Yeah, I think the consumer is also in support of that. And I yeah. think there was a, a survey done by Virtuoso, which is, as you know, one of the top end luxury operators they, that represent major travel agents around the globe. And seventy percent of their customer base said they would pay a little bit more to support sustainability and to support you know, a destination that is committed to sustainability. So I think consumers also recognize the importance of it and they're willing to pay a little bit more to support that. And uh, building, building hotels in Aloha, um, I don't know how much, uh, how, how close you are with the, uh, with the team that's developing. Build, building sustainability and eco-friendliness and environmental conscious consciousness into the hotel buildings and developments. Is it more expensive and pays off in the future or is it just as well as building your regular classic hardcore hotel? It is more expensive because the supply chain issues to get into a remote part of you know Saudi Arabia in the northwestern corner. But at the end of the day, it ends up being more cost effective because the consumers and the visitors support investment in sustainability. We did a what we call our, our uh, we did a big commitment to sustainability. We call it our cultural manifesto. We launched it in Paris three years ago, just before COVID, and everything we do is done sustainably to make sure it blends into the local environment, doesn't take anything away from the natural assets because we believe that we have to develop this destination responsibly and that's why we're willing to put our money where our mouth is, so to speak. I think to add to Philip's point, inspiring people is great. Like today in UAE, this year, the sustainability year, which is perfect. At least people are inspired. But then creating awareness, educating people, Hospitality or governments can do much, but then the awareness element, um, everyone should be responsible actually, should be responsible of uh, the planet as a planet that should be responsible on the little stuff actually from waste management, uh, uh, the water um, uh, element, water that is going to be missing at a later stage, etc. And think about others. So uh, we came up, uh, our CEO announced last ATM 2020, balanced tourism approach. Uh, our CEO, Rocky Phillips. And the balanced tourism up to is based on different pillars, be it the sustainable development, uh, um, attractions with a purpose, community engagement, and making sure that all of these are within the right ecosystem to make sure that we avoid the over-tourism. By avoiding over-tourism, you avoid destroying the planet, destroying the nature in which we are. Now, our aim as Ras al-Khaimah at Emirate to become, by 2025, the regional leader from a sustainability standpoint. And we work with EarthCheck, which is a leader uh, um, certification body out of Australia, to achieve this goal. But to achieve this goal, we need to certify businesses to work on the educational part, on the awareness part. Together as a community and as a team, this is the only way to achieve it. It's not only the responsibility of the government or the individual. It's really a partnership and we, again, we go back to the mindset. When the mindset is clear, then things could move uh, faster and smoother. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I don't know, I don't know where the organizers are. Do we have a way for the Q&A if there is any questions in the audience? No, we don't? Okay, that's fine. Um, okay, so um, I have um, one more question to you. Um, I think um, the hotel industry in general, worldwide, has been kind of for a while lingering on the verge of almost a conflict between the owners, the brands, and the managers, right? So this resulted in strange forms of hotel operation like, as, like, such as manchise uh, evolving, which is, you know, a hybrid is not always a good thing, right? Uh, management and franchise together. This has resulted in owners setting up their own asset man uh, sorry, their own hotel management companies, etc. So, many things. So, the re the reason I'm I'm going there is because um, this theoretically is also an innovative way to manage a hotel, and this is a different uh, different business model. So, 
what have you observed in um, in this regard? And do you think that this is moving forward or kind of taking us, uh, you know, sideways in terms of how the industry uh, should be evolving? Well, I think the first statement that I kind of disagree a little bit with is the conflict between owners and operators. The, the nature of our business is that we're supposed to be aligned. As an operator, we're supposed to drive value for the owner's asset. Okay, if we're not doing that, then we're not doing our job, right? So, you know, and, and this idea of franchise, mm, well, you know, there's management and there's franchise. Those are the two, the two business models. And certainly, we, we look and sometimes we have owners that start with a management approach and then within the uh, hotel management agreement, there might be an option to flip to, to franchise at a point in the future. But again, they're subject to certain thresholds being met. Again, because it's in the interests of the asset. Does the owner have the capability to manage, you know, et cetera? And that's where, you know, third party operators, asset managers also play a role in this equation. So I think, you know, there's many players in the industry. We all play our part. The, the value that certainly we as uh, an example like Accor is a big brand is our loyalty and distribution model, right? And the scalability that we have around the world. I don't know, David, if you see it differently. You... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, look, I mean, you know, the first group, we're, we're, I think the word hybrid is quite interesting because we are in an unusual setup, I think, to say the least. I mean, we, we, we started live as a developer. We then went on to, to actually sell off the individual units within the properties that we developed uh, and brought in outside operators to, to take over the operations of the, of the hotels that we had. We, we then sort of, from our personal perspective and our experience, we believed that we could, um, by setting up our own hotel management company, that we could provide a better level of return to the investors in our particular products. You know, so that then allowed us to set up, as I say, our own hotel management company. We moved um, our existing HMAs into franchises. Uh, and then we found ourselves with a situation where we've got this incredible brand strength of uh, seasoned hospitality professionals working for us. And really, you know, I needed to, or as a company, we needed to put them to work on, on not just looking after our own portfolio, but then seeking to, to help other people look after theirs. So, so that's why we then moved into the white label operator field. And so, uh, and that's something that, uh, you know, we, we've now started to do this year uh, with our first contracts this year. And, it's, and it is the future for us as we go forward. We're unlikely to do any more greenfield developments and therefore we see this as our future. So I think we sort of kind of represent all the different aspects that are presently available <laughs> in the market. And I think there's a place for everything. We also launched our own brand when we, we got to a situation where we weren't able to come to terms um, with, um, with some of the major brands that we would like to have had involved in our, in our products, you know, we then decided we ought, we'd launch our own brand, which we did on, on um, a number of occasions, on, on two hotels last year. And really, as, as Philip rightly says, though, the distribution is what's key here. Now, you know, the reason we went our own way, were, uh, there's lots of good reasons which I don't need to go into now, but, you know, distribution is something that is now making a circle back round and look at a soft brands to, to support our own brand in order to obtain that distribution, even though they've done very successful up to now, been very successful up to now. So I think, you know, we, we, as I say, we represent all different facets of the hotel industry as it is at the moment, and they all have their own merit at some, some way or another. But um, you know, we will certainly be going forward with our white label because we believe we can offer owners um, on the ground experience support which, uh, which can give them greater comfort than necessarily dealing with some of the, the larger international companies. But. Well, and, you know, and David, that, that's such an interesting thing when you talk about on the ground support because, you know, during COVID when many brands were, were looking to bring back people from regions like the Middle East, we actually doubled down in this region. We right. were actually the only region within a core that took on more responsibilities, took on more people to provide closer, more agile service to, to our owners. Because again, we deal with a lot of individual high net worth owners and that level of personal contact uh, pays dividends, right? Sure. You see it in your business model, we see it in ours. Yeah, 100%. Great. Thank you. Anything to add to the question? Yeah, I just rue the day that revenue managers became so powerful because they're the guys and ladies that make the decisions on whether or not you can book a group or you can bring an event to a destination. So as a destination promoter, um, I just wish that the revenue managers had a little less autonomy and we, they'd have a, we'd have a little more influence on, on their ability to give us better rates so we can book more business. So you know, whatever you two guys can do, 
put some pressure <laughs> on you. So that, that's an that's a real that's an interesting uh, yeah. topic, you know. I, and I, look, I came uh, through the the industry, uh, food and beverage and rooms, and obviously revenue management has evolved so much over the last thirty years. And you're right, revenue managers went from being you know a, a subset of sales and marketing to reporting to general managers directly. Uh, and the, the the way we distribute our product these days. Yeah, you know, they're, they're responsible for 50% or sometimes more of the hotel's revenue. Uh, at, the, at the same time, that's why you have a commercial team. Uh, and, you know, for me, when I was a general manager, I would sit, you know, in that chair between the director of sales and marketing and the director of revenue management. And you'd have these wonderful debates, sometimes arguments, they were great. Uh, and I loved them because it allowed us to talk through and ultimately as general manager be the, the tiebreaker when it comes to a vote. And sometimes that decision is not always a commercial decision, right? Because a revenue director will sit down, run a displacement analysis and say, look, the numbers are this, you know, uh, you're going to take this group, but pre and post, you are going to displace business because you're just not going to be able to fill those gaps. But the right thing to do may be because of the exposure, because of the client, because of it can lead to, you know, so you've got to take a big picture decision, right? And that's what general managers are, are there for. But they, have, but they have to be educated, and I think this goes back to another thing, and, and when we talk about innovation and uh, things, you know, as Accor, we run one of probably the best internal academies of any company I've certainly ever seen. Um, the and, graduates and of your general management program everywhere around the world in the industry are immediately visible. You can so, always see a person has gone through a core academy. So, yeah, so the core academy is great, but two of the courses that we run is the digital campus and the revenue management campus. And they're three day programs. You know, at the time of going through this, when I joined a core, I was doing my uh, MBA in EHL in Hotel de Lausanne. Great school. But the content that we were teaching our general managers and our revenue directors and directors for sales and marketing was exactly what I was learning during my MBA. So I'm like, okay, this is, this is great. This is up to date. It, it's powerful stuff. And, and I can tell you, for the last four years of being a VPO and a core, every general manager, every revenue director, every director of sales and marketing, I mandate and say, guys, you must attend both of these courses. So that way you've, you're all on the same educational plane and you're all making the right decisions. But it's a, it's a really great topic that you bring Yeah, I know, and I think you've hit the nail on the head when you say you've got to make sure that your general managers actually understand revenue yeah. management. Yeah. Because too often what's happened is revenue managers have gone between, from being advisors mm -hmm. to the decision maker. Correct. You know, and so they, you know, GMs are deferring to their revenue manager's decision, which isn't necessarily in the big picture the best decision to make. And I think you know, when it all comes down to numbers, then you've got a problem in this industry because this industry is hospitality and it's all about people. This is where AI would potentially also play a game by using it, whatever the background of the general manager if he needs an, this extra push, and then it would make everyone's lives uh, easier actually, potentially. But, but then on the technology front of that, on the, the revenue management systems behind those like ideas, easy RMS, all these other programs, it, it's making sure the revenue directors understand the technology you know, poor forecast inputs leads to poor pricing outputs, right? Garbage in, garbage out. And that leads to equally poor decisions. And, uh, you know, and again, for, uh, when I was a general manager, I would say, okay, I want to see the number of overrides you've done. Why are you overriding the system? Because the system exists uh, because it knows better. It can calculate these data points much better than an individual. So we shouldn't be doing the overrides. And I would assume there is probably some AI work happening around the revenue management in hotels. Yeah, behind the scenes. Yeah, behind the scenes. I know, depending I, on the persona. I would assume. Back to my earlier comment of speed, it's, it's moving so quickly. Yeah. You know, you, beco you become stale on this super, super quick. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, kind of wrapping up the revenue management conversation, this brings up a point that no matter what you do, no matter what you talk about, but this goes back to the, you know, century and thousand years old business model that the hotel is putting a head into a bed, right? <laughs> so, uh, gentlemen, we have just uh, a few minutes left. Um, and just uh, to kind of wrap up the topic, um, if this was uh, Christmas time and you could get any wish granted from the center that you want, 10 years down the road, how would an ideal hotel look and feel for you as a traveler from a purely personal perspective? Simple and intuitive. Y your comment about the light switch is spot on, right? 
So when we're looking at new designs, new builds, the first thing it's got to be is practical. So when we, um, when we evaluate a mock-up room or a benchmark room, we do ask the that the developer has all the technology in place so we can literally play with it and make sure that it makes sense. Okay, thank you. Mo? I would say customizable and uh, easy to tailor-made to our own needs, actually, the, given the the mindset, given the emotional element, and take into consideration the full human uh, element as I would feel it, and not as the brand would like to uh, give it to me. So customizable is like you walk into a hotel room and it's blank, empty, and you say, I'm in a blue mood today, so please give me so, some... Uh, <laughs> yeah, to this. Uh, so the immersiveness of the metaverse whatsoever, it future-proofs businesses, but also it future-proofs experiences. So. We will reach at this level at a later stage where you would customize your room based on your own uh, yeah, state of mind at this particular moment, actually. Uh, if you're angry, if you're upset, so if you're happy. So something that measures how, how we exactly. were feeling as you walk through the, the door. Emotional intelligence linked to AI, which makes it... And again, yes, looks like too much tech, but the reality is all linked to emotions. And when you have the emotional element uh, there, then it's all about the caring element of it. Okay. Thank you. So I would say authentic, experiential, and sense of place. You, you, when you visit a destination or you stay in a hotel, you don't want to be in a cookie cutter environment. You yeah. want to be where you are, you know, you recognize you're somewhere special, that you are getting experience that you can't find anywhere else. And I think that's where authenticity and experiential comes in. And then the sense of place is you know where you are and you, you, you understand and appreciate the local environment so that you can um, you know, take that message to a broader audience and help them understand what's happening in a particular place like Alula. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, I think really just echoing what everyone else has said, you want to be seen. You know, I want, I want to be arriving at a place that's taken the time to actually find out something about me before I get there so that when I do walk into the room, I feel that it is tailored to me rather than just, as you say, a normal cookie cutting room. And that, you know, care and be curious. That's what you want from any, any, any hotel, really. And it, it, but you don't really get it. So you want the people around you to care about you, be curious about who you are, and, and then deliver to those needs. You know? And it's not actually as difficult as it sounds, but we try and make it a lot more difficult. Wonderful. And what about you? Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I was just going to say. So in my dream, if it was Christmas and Santa told me I can have anything I want, in 10 years' time, I want hotels to achieve the level of innovation where they stop tucking the blanket under the mattress. <laughs> because I don't fit into those mattresses. Back to basics. <laughs> you, 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 I know you feel True. my pain. Um, I think this uh, wraps up our session. Uh, thank you, the audience, very much for listening. I hope thank this was uh, informative, interesting, and fun. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.